374. 374. We'll sing Send the Light. <clears throat> Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light, send the light. And a golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine. Everywhere I bound, send the light, send the light. And a Christ-like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Amen. Turn over to 147. <clears throat> 147, leaning on the everlasting arms. <clears throat> What a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. In this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all our loves. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. with just blessing on our offering, please. Holy Heavenly Father, we just come before your presence, Lord. Just very grateful for all that you do for us. Father, we thank you for the salvation that you provided through the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, how great that is. 
Father, we thank you for your creation and the wonders of it. Yes, Lord. We look about us and see all that your hand has made. We just stand in awe. Mm -hmm. Lord, we just thank you for this evening that we can come and worship you and hear your word preached. Lord, we thank you for your word that gives us guidance and direction. Lord, now we pray that you bless this offering. You did for your honor and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. Y'all can remain seated. Turn to 402. <clears throat> 402. It's been a while since we've done this one. <clears throat> so no throwing of stones. <laughs> Amen. about two more verses on that we're going to have it down amen turn over our last one 197 197 singing I go Jesus clings, nor any hill forebodes, a 
God at the cross of Calvary sings, praise God for lifted loads. Singing I go along life's road, praising the Lord, praising the Lord. Singing I go along life's road, for Jesus has lifted my load. The passing days bring many cares, but not I hear him say. When my fears are turned to prayers, the burdens slip away. Singing I go along life's road, praising the Lord, praising the Lord. Singing I go along life's road, for Jesus has lifted my load. He tells me of my Father's love and never slumbering I. My everlasting King above will hold my needs supply. Singing I go along life's road, praising the Lord, praising the Lord. Singing I go along life's road, for Jesus has lifted my load. When to the throne of grace I flee, I find the promise true. The mighty arms upholding me will bear my burdens too. Singing I go along life's road, praising the Lord, praising the Lord. Singing I go along life's road, have lifted my load. Amen. All right. Thank you so much for your singing. <clears throat> Well, let's take your Bibles and go to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter number one. <clears throat> I've been praying for a while about where the Lord would have us to go after we finished Revelation. And uh, that's kind of a hard one to follow, amen? It's kind of like the, the you know, there it is, you know? And, uh, <clears throat> but then I was thinking about John and... Uh, Anyway, I think there's going to be plenty that we see here. So whenever you find your place in John chapter 1, verse number 1, if you're able, I invite you to stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. We'll look at just a few verses <clears throat> this uh, evening in way of introduction of the Gospel of John. Chapter 1, verse number 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. I want to bring our message of in the beginning. In the beginning. Let's pray. Father, again, we want to thank you for allowing us this opportunity to be in your house this evening. And Lord, just to open up a portion of your word, we thank you for it. We pray, God, that you would use it to strengthen us, help us in our walk with you. And Lord, if there's one here that doesn't know Christ as Savior, that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, we're just so thankful uh, for the freedoms that you give us, that you allow us to be able to gather together. We think of Memorial Day tomorrow. And, and Lord, we don't want to take that for granted, all of the sacrifices that were made so that we can have the freedoms that we do today. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would continue to bless our nation and bless us in this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. We started, uh, kind of interesting, we started looking at the Gospel of John this morning in Sunday school, uh, if you were there for that, and of course that'll be the, the short uh, run through, but we were able to see a, a lot of uh, general details <clears throat> about that and how it's laid out and the structure of it and what makes it so much different than the other synoptic Gospels of uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, remember there was about 90% of the, the Gospel of John is different than the other Gospels. And, uh, and remember there's different reasons behind that. When through that in more detail. But ultimately, uh, what John wants to get us to is to understand the deity of Christ. And that's his, his big emphasis through there. Uh, where we saw, uh, like in the Gospel of Luke, there's going to be a lot of details in the midst of one of the miracles. There'll be a miracle, and, and Luke will go through, and he'll flesh out all the, uh, all the many details of who the family was, and what they were doing, and this is what they were wearing. You know, I mean, he's got all of the stuff that's there, which is typically what you want from the human aspect. You want to know the, from the humanity uh, side. Uh, John skips over that if he mentions it at all. And, uh, and he's getting to the Lord. And uh, ultimately that's what you always see through the Gospel of John.
John. He wants to get you to Christ as, as fast as possible. And that's the, that's the goal of the book. Uh, it's to get people to Christ as quickly as possible and to understand uh, who Jesus is and what it is that He came to accomplish and what was done. And, and we'll, we'll kind of see this as we go about. But, but think about it, man. This is John. Uh, John is sitting down to pen this, and 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 I just if you can get one thing, just kind of you know, I like I'm a visual person, but if you get one thing, just kind of in your mind about John, just picture him sitting down to the desk and a, and his pen flowing there in accordance with what the Holy Spirit's telling him to write. Uh, it's going to be a pretty amazing thing whenever you start thinking about all of these details and the depths of it that are there. Uh, there's a few things that stand out again from John than, than other Gospels and especially with uh, the life of the Lord. There's no genealogy uh, that's given in the Gospel of John. There's no scene of Jesus' birth. Uh, there's no account of His baptism. Uh, there's no account of Him being tempted in the wilderness. That's not uh, there. There's no Mount of Transfiguration that's there. And there's a few special miracles that are called out, but remember the purpose of the miracles are followed uh, by the expression of Jesus as God and how it is that He meets the needs of His people. We talked about the uh, the illustration in Sunday school this morning, whenever he's talking about the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, whenever you get to the feeding of the 5,000 in, in uh, John, it's so at the end of it, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He's always, he's using the illustration, but he says, let me tell you about who I am and, and what it is that I came to do. And so that's the, uh, the underlying theme that's going on uh, through, the, uh, through the book of John about how he meets needs. As we're closing out the book of Revelation, we saw there was a lot of references, remember it, uh, about how at the, at the end of Revelation it's like he's telling you, go back to Genesis again. Uh, start looking at all of those things. It's like he's, he's saying, you want to close the loop? Start over. And, I, and, and, and he wants us to be able to uh, see a little bit more. Remember we were talking about at the, at the end of the book as well as at the beginning of Genesis. You've got, uh, you've got a husband and a wife and they're uh, in the garden. Remember that word freely was used and how, uh, how the Lord said this is what I intended and this is how it is that it ends up. But, but John actually takes it a step further whenever uh, he starts and in verse 1 verse uh, of chapter 1 he says, In the beginning, in the beginning was the Word. Uh, and it causes us to go a little bit deeper in our understanding of the Word Himself. Uh, boy, there's a lot that's piled into, uh, into this passage. And so one of the things that uh, becomes very evident as soon as we start reading the Gospel of John is the boldness that John has in sharing the deity of Christ. Uh, listen, this is a major thing for him whenever he, uh, you don't pin something as bold as that. I mean, he's, he's, he's telling us Jesus is God. Yeah. You don't pin something as bold as that uh, if you're not convinced of it firsthand. Amen. If you're not sure if John was convinced of Jesus' deity, he plainly, uh, he relays that Jesus is God. Something else that becomes very uh, evident very early is the simplicity of John's Gospel. Uh, this is one of those things that oftentimes people say, well, you know, whenever a person is newly saved, where do you, where do you get started? Uh, you probably don't, you know, send them to, to the book of Numbers, you know. Uh, where are you going to get started? Well, you know, the Gospel of John, that's a great place. And a lot of it is because it is uh, relayed very simply. The, the, the definitions, the uh, vocabulary and everything that's there. Uh, it's written on about a seven-year-old reading level seven-year-old reading level. Now, how do you figure that? Uh, John uses about 600 different words in his gospel. That's, that's it. Now, typically for kids, you add about 100 words per year. And that's where they kind of come up with that, saying, well, it's about a, a seven-year-old uh, reading level. But, or at least vocabulary, uh, you know, would probably be better than, than saying reading level. Uh, but uh, but it, it's very simple. Uh, he doesn't use words that you're going to have to get out your thesaurus and, and study. And uh, what in the world is this even talking about? But there's, uh, the other side of that is, is there's such a depth uh, that comes whenever you start looking at those words. And what does that word actually mean? I mean, man, it is, it is incredible. So John uses words that have some very real and very deep meaning. Uh, the words that he uses and the phrases that he uses, the, the way that he brings it out, he has, he's very um, a Jewish or Hebrew in the foundation of it. Now, what does that mean? Uh, John will take a simple uh, word, a simple phrase, and make a simple sentence, and yet you're blown away with the truth that he brings up. I mean, you're just like, wow, it's just incredible. And it's something, uh, honestly, whenever you, you think about how that's put together, we've got that imagery of John sitting at his, at his desk. This is only what God can do. 
Only God can do this. Man could never just sit down and pen a work like the Gospel of John by their own account and be able to have it so simple and yet so profound all at the same time. So we'll see a little bit of that uh, this evening. So verse number one, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now right away you notice the capitalization that's there. Uh, that's what you give whenever you've got a proper name. Amen. You use that capitalization. The word here is not just a document. Uh, this is where we, uh, we're going to gain something of the understanding, a, a, a little bit of that Hebrew mindset. Uh, whenever uh, they would mention a word, uh, it didn't just mean that word. It also meant the very basis of what that word represents. Uh, just one word, it was a matter of, of painting a whole picture and saying, uh, as much as you can go to the foundation of that word and build upon that word, whenever they use that word, that's what that word meant. So whenever, uh, uh, to, to say that Jesus is the Word, what does that mean? It's taking you, for the basis, it's taking you all the way back to the speaker himself. It's not just the Word that comes out. It's who it is that's speaking that Word. In this case, that means the Word is reflecting the very author of creation. Whenever we went through Revelation, remember, the thought was not to, uh, not to just peruse through Revelation to find out some, some nitty gritty details about the tribulation. That's not what it is. Oftentimes that's what people do whenever they want, they want to know, well, tell me all the, the dirt that's going to happen during the tribulation. That's all I want to know. That's not what the book of Revelation was about. Right. It's about the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the righteous judge. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the one that's the authority. He's the director. He's the sustainer of life. That's what you come out with whenever you see Revelation. So you see uh, you know, some of those other details that are there, but ultimately it's all about Jesus Christ. How does He reveal Himself? Now, how does He reveal Himself to us at all? Through the Word. It's through the Word. God's method of communication with the world it's through the Word of God. A lot of times people will think, uh, they'll make a statement, like, I just want to know God more. That's great. We all should. If you neglect the reading of the Word of God, you'll never know God more. How does He, how does he show us who He is? It's through His Word. Uh, how am I going to know how to handle any given situation in any given day? It's through the Word. Uh, it's not going to be because Bubba has a good suggestion at the plant. Amen. It's going to be because the Word of God and all of the wisdom of God it was left for us so that we could know, uh, know the answer and know, of course, Him personally. So in this verse it says, in the beginning, what's the next word? Was. The Word. Now, that's a great little verb. Amen. Real small. Just a small word. Three letter little word. But think about what it means. It means a lot. It's past tense. It means in the beginning. The Word was already there. Yeah, right. Amen. Uh, it's saying that the Word is a continuous state that is beyond time. Amen. Time is for creation. Amen. That's what it's for. Now whenever we left off in Revelation, now think about this. Uh, you remember time was still there. We say, well, it's in, it's in eternity, but time was still there. The seasons were still there. The, uh, the months were still there. He was calling them out. They, uh, God doesn't do away with time. Sometimes we have a misunderstanding about eternity. Eternity is not the absence of time. Eternity is the endlessness of time. There's never a point that I can find in Scripture that says uh, there is no more time when you get to heaven. There's no more time when, whenever we have a new heaven and a new earth. It doesn't say that. That's one of those things that we pick up from, you know, a gospel song somewhere. But in reality, we're like, wait a minute. Uh, God said there's still time. At the end, the very last, we said, he, he saw that, that time was there. But before there was time, before there was time, in the beginning was the Word. Before time ever existed, the Word was there. The Word had no beginning, and it will have no ending. Evolutionists like to tout the universe as being uh, billions of years old. But you know, they don't really know what happens before their theory of the Big Bang. They can't really answer those things. They don't have any answer for how long that little particle existed. Well, it was just like a little speck of dust, and then all of a sudden it imploded, and, you know, and, and all of a sudden all this stuff came out of nothing. 
that was just floating around in, you know, in, in space and all these type of things. Uh, but, but they don't have any answer for space. They don't have any answer for the particle. Where did that come from? Yeah. How? We don't know. How long? How long was it around before it supposedly blew up? How is it that that little speck that came uh, into a great explosion defied all of the laws of science? Yeah. Uh, science says whenever something is left to itself, it, then it, it actually degrades. It doesn't improve. How in the world did all of this that we have today come from a little particle of nothing? Well, you know, things just happen to line up just right. You've got to have a lot of faith to be an evolutionist. Amen. There had to be a creator. And before any existence of anything, there was God. Amen. See, true science has no problem whatsoever with the Creator. Uh, nothing about having God as our Creator denies any laws of true science. But scientists, that's a different story. Scientists would have to come to that same understanding and agree that there was a Creator. And we are the creation. And if we are the creation, what does that mean? It means there's an authority that's over us. Amen. And if the Bible is true, then all have sinned. And if the Bible is true, then there is a literal hell yep. as a payment for sin. And God is the one who sets the rule on how uh, heaven is attained. It's not man. It's not man's ideology. It's not man being a better person, being a better neighbor. We have to go by God's rules and God's plans, and that challenges the authority of man himself. And that's where John begins. John doesn't begin with time. That's kind of what we think whenever we say in the beginning. John begins with God. He says in the beginning God was already there. In the beginning was the Word. Now notice something else. He's, he begins, as he's talking here in verse number 1, we start seeing a listing of the Trinity. How's that? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was with God. In other words, there's uh, more than one person within the Godhead, and Jesus was one of those persons. It's pretty interesting. The Trinity can, found, can be found all uh, throughout Scripture. And God's creation, what is it? Uh, God's creation has a great way of reflecting the Creator. Uh, we have a triune universe. Amen. You start looking at all the things that are made up of the, of the, the three parts, but there's a triune universe. Uh, it's made up of space and matter and time. What about space? Space is triune. There's length and breadth and height. What about time? It's triune. Well, there's a past, there's a present, there's a future. It's amazing. Deuteronomy 6, 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. People say, well, that, that just means there's one. But you know, the very first sentence of the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens, or the heaven and the earth. That God there, capital G with a little O-D, remember that is Elohim. Yeah. Elohim. What is that? It's a plural noun. It means there's one, but there's multiple. Yeah. Amen. That's pretty awesome. In the beginning, God was there. The Creator was, was referred to in His plural Form. Uh, so it means God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were all instrumental in creation. In verse 1 of our text, it continues on. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now watch this, and the Word was God. That means his nature, his person, his personality, his attributes, his character. Uh, Jesus uh, is the personification of God. It's everything that God is. He has all the essential characteristics of deity. Uh, he is, uh, Jesus exists independently of creation. Uh, don't fall into what the Mormons uh, teach, that Jesus was a man that grew into Godhead. Absolutely not. He has always been God. Amen. He is God in the flesh. He will never cease to be God. He exists by His own right, by His own ability. Amen. Nobody took His life. He gave up His life. That was, uh, that's only what God can do. I mentioned in Sunday school this morning that, that one of the lies that Jehovah's Witness kind of peddle is that, that Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, if you look in John 1.1, 1, 1, it says the Word, capital W, was God. Well, it says the Word, though. It wasn't talking about a person. Skip down to verse 14. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who's that? Jesus. And it says He is God. Notice the, uh, the power of that word. Now it says, the same was in the beginning with God. And in verse number 3 it says, all things were made by Him. All things were made by Him. 
we start seeing His power. We see His power in creation. Brother Coy mentioned it a minute ago. Whenever we, it's, it's, one of the, it's, it's impossible to look around and just take a moment and look at creation and not marvel at our God. Right. He just looks at it and says, God did this. Uh, this wasn't happenstance. We have a Creator God. We see His power. He says, all things were made by Him. That's an interesting thing. Uh, sometimes we'll say all things, and we just mean there's like a conglomerate, and instead of listing everything individually, we just say, well, you know, it's just uh, the stuff. Amen. That's our word for it. Stuff. What does stuff mean? Whatever's in the bowl. Amen. Uh, whatever's in the junk drawer, what's in there? A bunch of stuff. You know, uh, well, you know, here's the, uh, here's the uh, State Farm deal. Uh, here's a thing of paint, and uh, here's some scissors. You know, all that. Uh, we don't list them individually. We just say, it's all the stuff. It's in the junk drawer. It's, it's that. Whenever, uh, whenever God says all things, what does He mean? He means every individual thing. Every single thing. It's not just grouping creation together like it's a big uh, thing of soup. All things individually, all things separately. That little phrase is reference to all the infinite details of creation. We went to the, um, the Creation Museum, I guess it's been about 10 years ago. And um, it's before they had the ark, we've got to go back. But um, anyway, we went through the deal with the, um, uh, the star thing. What do you call that? That's it, planetarium. And uh, so anyway, you sit down in the chair and you kick it back and, well, they do it for you. But anyway, uh, you're sitting there looking up at the ceiling and he, he, they begin to show you the star show. Except there, they've got one at SFA, but this one's actually from a creation uh, perspective here. So, so they're going through and they start off, here's Earth, and then they start backing off, and here's this, and here's this, and here's the universe, and here's the galaxy, and here's this. And, and it gets to the point and says, now here's everything that, we, uh, that science knows right now, and we can't even see your whole galaxy anymore. It's just a little speck. You know, it's just, it's just so huge. It just starts backing out and backing out and backing out. The furthest expanses that we can, that we can see Jesus did that. All the stuff that we look at, we're like, man, we can't even fathom. We, we still don't know if Pluto's a planet. We don't know any of the, we don't know how far ours really goes. We got a good idea. It's like, all right, here's our universe. Jesus did that. And, and you'd never be able to get there in time in, in the amount of, of, uh, of speed to, to be able to travel that area, the speed of light for years and years to be able to get to the edge of what we can even see. But there's more beyond. Jesus did that. Man, just the, the greatest expanse that you can ever imagine, the farthest thing is created by Jesus. And then we go from the inanimate to living things. Each cell in a living creature, each cell is said to have a hundred trillion atoms. That's pretty awesome. A hundred trillion. Now, how do I know that? I looked it up online. <laughs> I have not counted. Amen. I'm assuming there's somebody that's got some science behind it, you know, whatever. Uh, it's a lot. Amen. I don't think they're going to miss it, even if they missed it by a trillion or so. You know, they're, they're still in good, good deal. They also say uh, that it's pretty interesting, but, you know, typically you'll take a little whatever and expand it out to what it needs to be to get your numbers. But anyway, uh, they said there's also about 100 trillion cells in a person. Yeah, pretty neat, huh? So, uh, and, and think about it, all that, those, that, that means super small. You're not going to see them. Amen. Very, very small. And it said the membrane of one of those cells is about one millionth of an inch thick. That's tiny. A millionth of an inch. Jesus made that. Amen. Man, that's just incredible. Jesus made it all. Verse 3, he says, all things were made by him. Every individual single thing that you can lay eyes on or can't lay eyes on, he still made it. It's amazing what it is that he's done. Verse 3 goes on and says, Without him was not anything made that was made. He says, If you can see it, he did it. Yep. If you know it's there and you still can't see it, he did it. Amen. Amen. There was nothing made without him. And what does that mean for us today? It's like, well, it just means it's pretty cool. 
Uh, think about it in, in, in life here. All the problems that come into your life that you think are too big for you, they're not too big for Him. And all the things in your life that you think are so small that nobody else will pay any attention to, Jesus does. Man, He is, uh, he is the Master. He is the Creator, omnipotent. He is the Word. And we see the power of His communication. Now look in verse number 4. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The Lord said by uh, the Lord is said by John to, to have power in communicating life and light. The more we know about life, the more complex it becomes, uh, the more it gets. You, you never get to the end of it. Think about the scientists whenever they start discovering, well, how thin is the, the wall of a cell? Wow, one millionth of an inch. That's pretty great. Well, the end of that, no. No, there's not. How in the world does that cell even hold together? Well, it's because there's some other structures in the wall of that cell. What are those structures? I don't know. But they're made up of something. Amen. It's not like a little water bubble. You know, it's like, well, just make sure you don't run into sharp objects. You know, uh, hey, God's got it together. Amen. He's, listen, as, as small as you get. I mean, you remember, think about it. They, they get down to the atom. They're not like, oh, we got it now. Smallest particle, th this is it. Smallest building block of all matter, it's the atom. What's that made of? Well, you know, come to find out, there's protons and neutrons and electrons. What's, what, about what about that other thing? There's that other little deal. Remember that God particle they were calling it, the little uh, cross membrane? You know, th there's all that stuff. And it's like the more powerful they can get a microscope to look, there's still more, to, yeah. still more there. <laughs> you, you just don't look at it and say, well, that was it. Yeah, you know, we just we looked a little more, and all it was was space. Now there's always something. God did that. And those are the things that He communicates with us. Every discovery, it testifies more of the hand of the Creator. And it proves that, that we have a God who is speaking to us. The more that we start looking at all of those things and, and how it is that it's related to us and how we start to see it and how we get over it, we're like, wow! Man, I've never even thought about that. That, that has to be a creator. That doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen by evolution. There has to be a creator. Well, that's whenever it really starts getting pretty awesome that you have the Word of God. Amen. Because that creator God wants to speak with us. He wants us to know His mind. Philippians 2.5 says, Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. How are you going to do that? He'll tell you. How's he going to do that? His word. Yeah. Listen, as John sits down at the table and he begins to pen out this gospel, I can't imagine how long it would take him to write these. I mean, he said, oh, we could write this in just 30 seconds, preacher. We'd be on chapter 2 if we just... No, I don't think so. I, I, I think whenever John just starts penning this, this is in the beginning was the word. Man, I bet his eyes wouldn't dry up enough to be able to see verse 2 for a long time. Yeah. Because he was the one who got to lay his head on the chest of the Word. He was the one who saw the Word suspended between heaven and earth, shedding his life's blood for his salvation. He was the one who, who was able to see the resurrected Christ. He's the one who penned the book of Revelation. He wrote Revelation 20 years before he wrote the Gospel of John. How do you follow that up? How, do you, how can you possibly imagine? He's able to see all of these things that God is telling me. Everything that we spent 40-something weeks going through the book of Revelation and seeing all of those events and the things that, that remember John, whenever we left, all he wanted to do was worship. Man, that's all he wanted to do. Every time you turned around, the angel's there. Man, I'll worship you. And he says, get up, man. You, you worship God. Quit it. But what was his desire? His desire was to worship God. Yep. Yes. 20 years later, he sits down to pen the gospel. And he says, in the beginning. Amen. Oh, man. He's already seen the ending. Yeah. Hey, Ben. And he goes back to the beginning. 
Oh, I can't imagine what he was going through whenever he had penned these words. John has seen the whole transpiration of events, and he knew that Jesus was the one who ends darkness. Now think about that, what he says here. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Pretty interesting. If you go down to verse number 9, it says, That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Verse number 9 says that Jesus is the true light which lighteth every man. I like that. Uh, Moses was a light. Amen. Moses was a light for his, for his people, for the nation of Israel, whenever they walked uh, out of darkness and into freedom. Uh, David had been a light. So was John the Baptist. All of these men were, they were types of Christ, but there's only one true light. There's only one true light, and that's the Lord Himself. Yep. And that's who John has the privilege to be able to pin about. With that in mind, John makes this, this great transition into this whole theme of light. I can imagine John still sitting there thinking about his early days and of the Lord's ministry. Thinking about what he's already seen of the Lord and through the book of Revelation. He's already penned it. He's like, man, how can you ever? And he starts in the beginning. I wonder, it's pretty interesting, you know, all of a sudden then he's like, starts with John the Baptist. He says, man, in the beginning, he's the word and everything, but he's like, hey, how do you leave out John the Baptist? And he begins to pin those things about uh, John the Baptist. Look at verse number 6. He says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Uh, John the Baptist is one of the more interesting personalities in the Bible. But uh, eh, obviously so. Uh, somebody that's going to be the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ is probably not going to be the guy that just kind of blends in in the background and nobody ever notices. Yeah. Amen? Uh, that kind of defeats the purpose of what it is that, that he came to do. He actually had a, he had a work. He had a ministry. He was to be bearing witness of that light. Uh, so he had a great, great mission. Uh, his mission had been a long time coming. Uh, keep your spot. Go back with me to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40. No, we were there not too awful long ago. Isaiah 40. Look what he says in verse number 3. It says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley should be exalted, every mountain and hill should be made low, and the crooked should be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord should be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Can you imagine whenever Isaiah is pinning this? I mean, just think about Isaiah for a second. He's, he's, he's pinning this down. Again, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's putting it down there. But I'm sure he was sitting there saying, how in the world is anybody going to hear anybody that's crying in the wilderness? Yeah. I mean, what good is crying in the... You go crying in the city, in town square. That's why they call them the criers. Amen. Go to the crier. He'll, he'll go through the city. But he says, uh, who's going to be crying in the wilderness? Who's going to hear? But it all comes to light whenever we get to John the Baptist. Man, all of a sudden, he got their attention. Amen? In Matthew 3, in the first three verses, it says, it says, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 1, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. All of a sudden, John the Baptist is crying in the wilderness. Everybody knows who he is. Man, there is no hiding this guy whatsoever. Hey man, or just, or nobody's saying, did y'all hear there's some guy in the way? No, everybody's talking about it. Everybody's going out to see him. John had a unique message that was absolutely key in that he brought together the law and the gospel. He was merging those two together. What was he doing? Pointing people to Christ. Yeah. He said, here's the answer to it all. There's a period of 400 years of silence from God, no prophet. 
Nobody giving a message. And then John the Baptist comes proclaiming things in the wilderness. People were still performing the Old Testament rituals, but now uh, now's the time for the Messiah to come. John had a, a likeness to those Old Testament prophets. Man, the things that they had heard about, those things of Elijah, he had the same kind of attitude as Elijah the prophet. He wasn't a man exalting uh, his privileged life like the Pharisees. He wasn't wearing the fancy clothes and, and asking everybody to bow down and respect him and, and all that. That wasn't what he was about at all. He wasn't in it for the money. Amen. He had a mission. And that mission was from God, and he was earnest about that. You know, in old times, whenever, um, whenever somebody important was coming into town, that's where those criers would kind of come in. So they would send somebody out saying, hey, here he comes. Everybody, here he comes. That was the point of, uh, of somebody that was crying out. All the people and the crowd, they'd get ready to greet and to honor the one that was coming into town. John the Baptist, he was the crier in the wilderness. He was the one that was blowing the trumpet, so to speak. He was notifying the people that, that the one who was coming was of great significance. Look at it, verse number 10. We're almost done. It says, he was in the world, and the world was made by him. Think about that. He stepped into his own creation. Yeah. That's incredible. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own. His own received him not. God made sure that every man would have an awareness of the light that he gave. That's what it says in verse number 9. It says, uh, That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. You know, every person has a certain measure of light. They have a certain understanding that there is a God. They have their own conscience that bears them witness whenever they see creation. Uh, you hear the, the missionary accounts, missionary going to a place they hadn't seen outside person outside of their tribe and all of their life, and yet all of a sudden they've got a spot out there in the river where they take all their goods to and set it on fire and burn to try to appease the gods. They understand that there is a God. They understand that, that they didn't just blow up and there they were. They knew that there's something else, they just don't know who He is. And God says, I want you to know who I am. How are you going to know who that Creator God is? He says, I'm going to give you the Word for every man. What you do with the Word, that's a decision for you individually. But God gives you His Word. The Jews were given that task that they were supposed to give the details of, Jew, uh, of Jesus being the light. They were supposed to be looking all the time for the coming of the Messiah. They were supposed to recognize Him. They were supposed to publish exactly who He was. They were supposed to speak up for Him. But in verse number 11 it says, He came into His own, and His own received Him not. God had been preparing them for centuries. He was telling them, Messiah's coming. But whenever Jesus actually came, they didn't, they didn't have a use for Him. They were too occupied with their selves. You see, through the book of John, we're going to say, man, he, here's the guy who's going around forgiving sin, healing various disease, raising the dead, calming storms, showing that he has power over nature, over sickness, over all the infirmities. He did all of those things that only God could do, Amen. and yet they rejected him. We're also told in verse number 10, it says that he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. The world that he made didn't know him. But John tells us something in verse, look down verse 12 and 13. He says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He says, There were those that received him, and all those that received him, he was given that power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe. His name is absolute key to salvation. And that's where John starts. There would be nothing that John could ever pen that would be of any benefit if it didn't revolve around the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. His entire life revolved around Jesus. He, again, he witnessed revelation. He penned it. And here he is, he's writing again, and he says, let me tell you the start to the finish. That's where we're going to stop today. Before we close... Just think about that. Uh, 
All the things that John was able to see and the things that God wants us to know about himself, salvation is in Christ alone. Does that include you? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Throughout the ages, all of the discoveries that will ever be made. You know, I, I, I get amazed sometimes. <clears throat> I just think about, you know, it wasn't very long ago uh, whenever Kim and I were just married. That wasn't that long ago. Amen. We didn't have a cell phone. Think about it. We barely had internet. And most of the time it didn't turn on. You remember you had to get those discs that send them to you in the mail and then you'd have to subscribe for 30 bucks a month or whatever it was. That was a deal. This was only $29.99. Prodigy. Amen. You'd plug it in. You know. There was, you didn't just click something on. You didn't ask Google how to get to McDonald's. Hey, Ben. Man, it's so, it came so very fast. So very fast. Things that, that quite honestly, I, I would have said, you know, I was more of a tech person at that time. And I would say, said, no way. No way. I mean, I remember I was high cotton because I had a bag phone for work. It only worked on top of a hill. But I mean, I was like, hey, I got the back phone. <laughs> Regardless of the amount of discoveries that we'll ever know, Jesus said, the one thing I want you to know, I want you to know my son. That's what matters. The word. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. We have the great, great privilege. Think about this. We study through books of the Bible on Sunday nights. And it's not just to be able to say, all right, check that one off. It's so we can know Him. That's it. That's what God wants. He wants us to know Him. Do you know Him? If you died today, would you go to heaven? If not, today's the day of salvation. Amen. I hope he's your Savior. Let's all stand together. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. Our Father, we want to thank you for the day that you give and for the grace that you extend to us. Thank you, Lord, for just allowing us just a little bit of time to be able to look upon your word and to be reminded of who you are and the power that you possess and the very fact that you want to know us personally. Lord, I do pray if there's one here that doesn't know Christ as Savior that today would be the day of salvation. And I pray, Lord, that each of us, whenever we start to think about what it is that has transpired to allow us to have this, this time and this study, I pray, God, that we would strive all the more just to know you. And, Lord, to be pleasing to you, to honor you with our life. Lord, we all stand to grow closer to you, and I ask, God, that you would do a mighty work in our own hearts. Lord, please just accomplish through this study what, what it is that you desire in each of us. And we just want to thank you for it. I pray, God, that we're surrendered to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing page 308. 308, we'll sing I Surrender All. If you'd like to be able to come and pray, I invite you to do so. We need to talk about salvation. We can do that as well. It's however the Lord moves this evening. All to Jesus I surrender him in his presence daily live I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all all to Jesus Jesus, I surrender humbly at his feet I bow worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now I surrender all I surrender My blessed Savior, I surrender all. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this evening. And we'll close out in a word of prayer. If you're traveling, uh, please be safe. 
uh, watch out. A lot of folks on the roadway this weekend, and uh, be praying for the rest of our church family. I know there's a lot of folks that are out traveling uh, today and will be tomorrow as well. So just keep everybody in prayer. Sure would appreciate that. Thank you again, Hortons, for visiting with us. So glad to have y'all this evening. And Brother Webster, if you'll dismiss us in prayer, sure would appreciate it. <laughs>